Greetings and salams to all of you. It has been many months since I've made a recording and um, I'm still spending most of my time at my little cabin in the forest. But it occurred to me that um, you might enjoy um, hearing me read a bit from The Spy of the Heart. Um, I was asked by different friends uh, recently how it is that I came to um, come into the Islamic faith. And uh, in fact, it was a process uh, that took many years. Um, but um, I guess uh, the significant thing is in the 1980s, specifically 1989, when I was traveling through Afghanistan, the difficulties of that overland trip on horseback and by foot um, sort of opened me up and uh, the privations actually made me sense more of what my own deep instincts were. And there was some amazing uh, experiences that I had with the people. And in particular, there was one fellow, his name is uh, Burhanuddin. Here we see a picture of him on his horse. Uh, and He's very much part of this uh, story that I want to read to you, the events. And um, because in them, uh, what I find is the um, sort of the, the particular moment or the particular period of time that um, I started to uh, take all of this uh, more seriously, meaning to have, in addition to a spiritual practice, to have a uh, a religion as a practice. And I had been raised as a Catholic and was finding myself uh, more and more um, unable, unable to uh, worship in that manner and in no way uh, out of disliking that religion. It just uh, didn't um, speak to me anymore at the level that I would be engaged in that practice as I had been growing up as a child. So I'm going to read to you from Spy of the Heart and where I open, I'm speaking to an Arab in Quetta, a city that's at the border of Pakistan and Afghanistan. And uh, in that city, I met an Arab and his name is Abdul Haq. And he uh, spoke fluent English and was very wealthy. Uh, and we had been talking. So here's where I pick up. Let me tell you a story, Abdul Haq. Earlier this year, I was traveling with a small group on horseback through Afghanistan. After many adventures, we found our way into the remote region northwest of the Hazarajat. We took a detour from the easier road to Hamide because of fighting and made our way from Chiras towards the Turkestan mountains. There was an old man with us, Burhanuddin was his name. He was our guide. He came from the region and knew most of the tribes settled in the area, as well as the various nomadic peoples 
who migrate their flocks each year from higher to lower elevations to graze them. We were very lucky to have him with us. I can tell you that he saved me from disaster several times. And just how did he do that? Well, there are many stories about him, but here's one that I often remember. Late one afternoon, we were traveling through a valley when we saw hundreds of people and their animals in a distant caravan coming our way. You know, Abdul Haq, there are large tribes of nomadic people, even Arab nomads, who have been here from ancient times. Anyway, throughout the journey, Burhanuddin was traveling on foot. He didn't have a horse. I felt badly about this and wanted to share my horse with him, at least occasionally, but my Uzbek companions wouldn't hear of it. When Burhanuddin saw this large group of nomads in the distance, he came up alongside and said, Sekandar, sir. Sekandar was my name at that time. Tell Muhammad Ali to give me his horse. Tell him now. There's danger here. What danger? I asked him. These nomads have a history of banditry. They mustn't know that you are a foreigner. They mustn't be allowed to look too closely at your supplies. There's no time. Tell Muhammad Ali now. I told my reluctant assistant, Muhammad Ali, to give Burhanuddin his horse. Burhanuddin advised me to ride close to him and be as silent as possible when the nomads approached us. You will behave as though you are my son, he said. I did as he said. When the nomads approached, I saw that they really were a wild looking bunch. They eyed us as they passed by and some of them came close to look over our pack animals. Burhanuddin picked out their leader, the patriarch of their tribe and called out loudly in salutation. Peace upon you, may you live long. May your shadow not vanish, he said. The man rode up to us and saluted him in return. The others held back. Burhanuddin identified himself and his own tribe at Chiras, and the patriarch asked about certain people he knew there. The patriarch then looked over at me. His dark, leathery face was a mask of deep wrinkles framed by a flowing white beard that started under the lower folds of his turban and came down to his chest. Pale turquoise eyes flashed from his aged face as he scanned me. Peace upon you, he said. And peace upon you, I answered. Burhanuddin quickly told him that I was his son. And fit he looks your son. May he live long. May your journey be prosperous. The patriarch had only passed a minute with us and then moved on with his tribe. I thanked my fate that it was dusk and that he didn't ask more questions. Their caravan passed like a tidal flow of voices carried in the dust of pounding hooves and the smell of animals into the distance behind us. You see, Abdul Haq, this is just one example of Burhanuddin's wisdom and resourcefulness. Actually, I wanted to tell you another story about him, I said. Yes, uh, please go on, he said. I'm enjoying your storytelling. Well, after this episode with the nomads, there were many other adventures. We moved north out of the Hazarajat and into the Bandi Turkestan, the Turkestan mountain range that separates the north and south of Afghanistan. As we climbed higher, 
maybe to 8,000 feet or so, we entered beautiful valleys inhabited by Persian-speaking farmers who irrigated their terraced lands by digging channels to the rivers. As we rode along, we passed by some of the villagers. They were visibly impoverished. You see, Abdul Haq, it turned out that despite the watered land, there were locusts and sun pests, another insect, voraciously feeding on the villagers' wheat. It was late September. Because of the high elevation, the wheat was only then maturing. But much of it had already been consumed or ruined by the insects as we arrived in the area. If the sun pests settle on even a portion of the crop and suck the milky sap from the wheat as it forms, they leave a bad taste in the rest of it as it matures. Anyway, we were really tired out from having been constantly on the move on the dangerous main corridors, and we were looking for some place to rest up for a couple of days. I was hoping we might find shelter in one of these out of the way villages. We approached one village where people came out to greet us. Peace be upon you. May you live long. Please stop and rest. You are our guests, an elder said to us. I studied the man who seemed ill to me at first. Then I noticed that a number of them were very thin. It's famine, Sikandar, Burhanuddin told me. Please stop and accept our hospitality, the man repeated. I was taken aback both by his condition and his offer. How was he to offer us hospitality? Except for Buharnuddin, the others in our party were wary and wanted to move on. Sikandar, we must not stop here, Muhammad Ali whispered. You can see they have nothing. They know we have supplies. These are good people. I know them, Burhanuddin interjected, annoying a couple of my companions. Muhammad Ali looked at them suspiciously, then gave me an uncomfortable look. I felt inclined to stop there. One reason for this was their surprising appearance. Many of them looked European. Several had reddish hair and beards, and many had blue and green eyes. They seemed very calm and peaceful, even though, like all Afghans, some carried weapons. Now, at this juncture, I'm going to show you a picture of one of these people, so you can see what I mean about how they look European. There were many of them. Uh, with fair skin and red or blonde hair. But back to our reading. These were old fashioned muskets that had to be packed with powder. A couple of them backed up nervously when I pulled out my camera. They seemed to have no idea what it was. I couldn't help wanting to take some photographs. I realized what was going on, so I pointed the camera at my traveling companions and asked them to smile and pose. Burhanuddin explained to the villagers that I was making an image of my friends. Did you get their pictures? Abdul Haq asked me. Yes, Abdul Haq, I did take photos of them. They were fine once they knew the camera wasn't a gun. Back to my tale. I had never seen anything like these people in Afghanistan. My curiosity overcame me and Burhanuddin's recommendation was all I needed to order a halt. We'll stop here, I said. The others looked worried, but were so tired that they didn't put up a fight. We dismounted our horses and sat with the old man and others who came to meet us. They were all very thin 
even the children. Yet they seemed happy to have us there. They apparently had few visitors since this route was well off the main road. Although I couldn't imagine how they would offer us hospitality, they soon made some tea from a local herb. They then cut and bundled some wheat stalks that had survived the insects and passed the kernels over an open fire. They pulled the swollen wheat grains from the stalks and rubbed them through their hands. The burnt skins fell away, revealing puffed ivory grains. They gathered these in a wooden bowl, which was handed to me. The wheat smelled wonderful. I could barely eat, seeing the hungry people seated around me watching. Burhanuddin was sitting beside me. He smiled and said, Eat, Sikanda. They are offering you hospitality. Eat. Do not deny them this. I picked up some of the grains and chewed on them. They were really delicious. I was tired and emotional as I sat there. I couldn't hold back my tears as I ate the food before me. The villagers watched with satisfaction for a while. Conversations started and they began to ask many questions about us. Their Persian was very unusual and I think quite an old dialect. Judging from their light hair and eyes, I doubt that these tribes had been conquered by the many Turkic invaders over the centuries. They were of an older stock of people that scholars thought once dominated the region. They noticed my blue eyes and asked who my parents were. Who is your father? From what tribe is he? They are from very far away, I answered. Are they from near Kabul? One of them asked. No, much, much farther. Not from inside Afghanistan, I said. The man looked at me, trying to understand. It became clear that very few of them had ever traveled beyond these mountains. My host, Firuz, talked about having gone to Herat and mazar sharif and once long ago to Kabul. I see that you have been having problems with the locusts and sun pests, I said. Has this been going on for very long? The villagers grew serious as I brought this up. The bones in Firuz's face became more prominent as his smile relaxed and his skin settled over his cheekbones. This is the third year and the worst yet for us. We have planted our last stock of seed. We do not know if there will be enough to plant next year. We do not know when the insects will stop. Firuz looked sad and weary as he explained their circumstances. These villagers had not experienced the war. They were too far off the beaten track to be of any interest to either the Marxists or the Mujahideen. They had nevertheless been unknowing victims of the war. You see, Abdul Haq, prior to the Soviet invasion in 1979, there had been an Afghan-Soviet partnership to hold the locusts and sun pests in check. These insects had plagued the region for decades. This was an international program. It had to be because of the breeding and migratory patterns of these pests. With the advent of the war, the program slowly came to a halt. What will you do if these pests return next year? I asked Firuz. Allah is gracious and giving. His wrinkled face betrayed his anxiety about their future, but he spoke with conviction. We spent the night there 
and I was able to talk more with Firuz and the villagers. It was a beautiful night, and I made my bed under the starry sky. I slept badly, though, waking up now and then, thinking about my life and how different it was from the life of these villagers. It occurred to me as I lay there that despite my upbringing, education, privilege, and freedom of choice, I was morally and spiritually inferior to these people. They faced starvation, but spoke of faith in God and his mercy. I was unsure whether I would have their strength. Actually, as I reflected upon things that night, I knew that I would not have the patience and humility to face the crisis the way they did, even though I have faith in God. I concluded that it was their application of the practices of religion as well as their faith that had made them so accepting and strong in the face of such an insurmountable disaster. And this led me to consider more closely the practice of religion as distinct from doctrine. I started to think more about the value of religious practice in helping to make a better person. It goes without saying that I think of these villagers often. My contact with them has continued to make me think about the message with, of Islam. This is a moving story, Sikandar, Abdul Haq said. He had completely quieted down as I told him this story and had grown quite serious as he listened to me. I do agree with you now, he said after a thoughtful pause, that we both have far more freedom, certainly, than those people. I feel moved by your story of their response to the famine. They certainly are good Muslims from your description. I wish that I had their patience and humility. But tell me, whatever happened to Burhan Adin? Well, that is the interesting thing. He turned out to be quite different than any of us first imagined. When we met him at Angurada on the border of Afghanistan, he presented himself to us as a vagabond. He whined about needing our help. When we finally reached Shiraz, where he lived, many people came out to greet him. I remember that day quite well. We were whisked off to a place to bathe and were given new clothes. Delicious food was brought to us, and we had the leisure of a nap. Later that day, Buhanuddin reappeared in fine clothing, attended by a good number of people. It, it then became clear that he was a powerful village elder. But why did some of these people not accompany him on his trip to Pakistan in the first place? Abdul Haq asked. There are many things about Burhanuddin that I was never able to understand, I answered him. But I really came to feel that he was there to help me. I realized that sounds self-centered, but in so many ways, I felt that he was a gift. At the very least, I enjoyed his company and learned from him. While we journeyed together, he never stopped telling stories about the things that mattered in life. I will always remember his guidance, taking us on the remote route that brought me to the people of those mountains. This was a real blessing that allowed me to better understand Islam. It made me think much more about the purpose of spiritual and religious practice. So I'm going to stop my reading there and I would just like to uh, finish uh, again by reiterating what I said when I started this video. There is something to be said for an external practice. There's a great deal to be said for it uh, in the sense that um, 
we engage all of ourselves in the practice. And this would be true even in Christianity, where I was raised. There was prayer. My brother and I used to pray every night um, on our knees next to each other, facing a crucifix on the wall. We used to go to the Catholic Church and receive communion. And I must say, all of that was, in those days, a fine preparation for me and a fine way of um, opening myself to turning to the divine. And um, when I came into Islam, two years at least before I did, I actually did start fasting and doing the prayers. I wanted to see if I would be able to do these things. However, I am a Westerner after all, and I was an unusual Westerner in that I was raised in Tahiti, French Polynesia, where we have a very lenient and free culture. So I suppose everyone has to find their way in the religion. But I think the important thing in the Islamic practice is to benefit from the prayers, to benefit from the fasting uh, as recommended for those who are in good health. And to, of course, very much like in all the religions, um, try to give charity, try to be kind, try to not judge others, etc. But I'd say the prayer itself uh, is a valuable exercise. It brings um, what's inside to the outside and it brings what's outside to the inside to our hearts. So anyway, it is now uh, almost Christmas and I just wanted to connect with all of you and hope that you are all in good health and wish you a wonderful new year. May all of us find better times in 2021. Thank you so much.